Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash, the kiss of Judas. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Not a pleasant subject, but a necessary one for the time in which we live. Necessary for all time, but particularly as we get closer to the return of Jesus, this teaching and others like it will become increasingly pertinent and important to the faithful body of Christ and the faithful believers who await his return. The kiss of Judas. We've pointed out many times that Judas as the son of perdition, had the spirit of Antichrist, and he is the number one type of Antichrist in Scripture, even more so than Herod the Great, even more so than the deified emperors, even more so than the various Old Testament figures. There is no type or shadow of Antichrist more crucial that we understand in order to be able to comprehend the coming Antichrist and identify him than Judas Iscariot. Judas the betrayer. His name is synonymous with treason, with betrayal. Not just a colloquial name like Benedict Arnold or Guy Fawkes or Menlaus, but something beyond that. We are told in the book of Daniel that those who defend the truth at the end and who understand the deception that will come from Antichrist in the character of Antiochus Epiphanes will be those who are in the character of the Maccabees, according to Daniel chapter 11, 33 to 35. These are those who have insight among the people who will give understanding to the many. But we are warned, just as what happened with the Maccabees, many will join with them in hypocrisy. There will be people who will get on your bandwagon. They will be your sounding boards. They will echo your own pronouncements. They will seemingly be one of you and stand with you, opposing what you oppose, and even feigning to believe what you believe. But their agenda is their own. It is not God's. These are the most sinister and dangerous of Satan's agents, the ones who are most effective at counterfeiting a loyal brother or sister. And understanding the kiss of Judas, let's begin by defining plainly what it is not. It is not something personal, even though it may have some personal ramification or aspect or expression. In other words, it's not that guy was my friend and he was my brother and the Lord and he betrayed me and let me down or she betrayed me and let me down. I felt stabbed in the back. I felt betrayed by her. I felt betrayed by him. It is not personal. Their betrayal is of the Lord and of his word. Any betrayal that's incumbent upon you or me is a consequence of the fact that the one who gives the Judas kiss has betrayed the word of God, has betrayed the word. We are simply caught in the crossfire, as it were. It is not somebody who lets us down or betrays us personally. It is someone who betrays the word of God and as a consequence or derivative of that comes against us in an act of betrayal in some way. Let's begin by understanding now the kiss of a Judas. Twelve major points on the kiss of Judas. This is going to happen increasingly before the Lord comes back, and it's happening already. Let's look at some instances. The wildest expression that spread almost like a wildfire that I have seen involving the kiss of Judas ever goes back to the 1990s, to the time of the counterfeit revivals in Toronto, Canada, Pensacola, Florida, and their imitators in Lakeland and other places, but particularly Toronto, followed by Pensacola. The kiss of Judas came from people who knew it was wrong. 
I knew many ministers, many preachers, and many denominations, Baptists, conservative Anglicans, and especially Pentecostals, who privately admitted it was not a real revival, that it was not an authentic move of God, that it was a counterfeit. But for the sake of self-interest and theocratic politics, for the sake of their buildings, for the sake of their superannuation and retirement fund, for the sake of their credentials and standing in the denomination, for the sake of their pension, for the sake of their salary, for the sake of anything and everything except the Lord, his word, and his sheep. They compromised with it and turned against those who opposed it. The worst I'd seen was in British Pentecostalism. There were many people in the ELA movement and in the Assemblies of God, who I knew personally, who privately admitted they knew it was wrong, but they distanced themselves from myself and from the late Philip Howell and from other Pentecostals who opposed it because of self-interest, even knowing it was wrong. They were driven by this self-interest, and they turned against those who stood up for what they knew was the truth. They deluded themselves, of course. They tried to pretend it was a revival, but they knew it wasn't, and many privately admitted it was not. This is the kiss of Judas, knowing it was wrong, but pandering to the religious establishment that is being satanically manipulated. They will turn against the faithful brethren for their own self-interest. British Pentecostalism became built on this kind of hypocrisy, the kiss of Judas. Well, let's look at a more contemporary example. As we speak, J.D. Greer, the present president of the Southern Baptist Conference or Convention, the SBC, he gave a robust speech demanding that born-again believers, Baptist Christians, be the most ardent, articulate, and robust defenders of homosexual rights. You will begin to treat them first and foremost like people who deserve compassion, not scorn or judgment or a political voting block that we need to marginalize. When you understand that, then what that means is that you become a person who will, for example, stand up and be among the fiercest advocates for the preservation of the dignity and the rights of LGBT people. Now understand what homosexual rights include as they define those rights. The right to same-sex marriage, the right to adoption, and to bring children up in a homosexual relationship mimicking heterosexual marriage with two fathers or two mothers. They call that their rights, and the president of the Baptist Union, a man with the spirit of Judas, a son of Judas, saying that Baptists, born-again believers, should be the number one advocates of this. This is the kiss of Judas. He's turning against those Baptists who are telling the truth in reading Romans chapter 1, that this is an abomination, it is unnatural, it is detrimental to society, it is detrimental to children, and it is detrimental to the church to say otherwise. This is the spirit of Judas. J.D. Greer has given the body of Christ the Judas kiss. And the argumentation he uses, we should whisper about it because the Bible only whispers about sexual issues. Uh, does it? Look what Jesus said about whoremongering. Look what Romans 1 says about homosexuality. It's not a whisper. It's imprecatory. It's exclamatory. But the Judas kiss doesn't care. There's always an agenda. Well, let's understand 
who will give the Judas kiss and why? First of all, one, the Judas kiss is a counterfeit of the holy kiss. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 20. All the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. Read with me, please, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And also, please, look with me to Romans chapter 16, verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. We see this as something that's repeated in Scripture. It was a normal cultural practice among believers in the early church. The holy kiss, the brotherly kiss, the holy kiss. The kiss of Judas is a counterfeit of that. Those who give the Judas kiss will pretend that it is normal Christian brotherhood, that they are just behaving in a normal Christian manner as they perpetrate their treachery. They will masquerade their treachery and their treason, not of us, but treason of Christ. They will masquerade it with brotherly behavior. They will carry on as if they are normal believers doing the things believers do and they're being so friendly and kind to each other and trying to show a spirit of fellowship and brotherhood or sisterhood, they'll greet with a holy kiss, only it will be the kiss of Judas. Look with me, please, to Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Matthew 26, verse 48. My apologies. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one sees him. They perpetrate their betrayal under the camouflage of normal Christian behavior, colloquialism, expression. But it's the Judas kiss. They know how to hide it. They know how to disguise it by behaving in an outwardly Christian manner. First thing we have to understand about the Judas kiss is that it is well camouflaged with normal Christian behavior, colloquialisms, expressions, well, well disguised. Second, Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, verse 70. Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. For he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. These people are among the chosen. They're backsliders, they're false brethren, they're something. But it doesn't just say many are called. Many are called, few are chosen. These were people who at some point had been believers. They'd been one of us. Many will fall away. Do not believe in unconditional, once saved, always saved. It is not scriptural. If you believe that error, you are going to be a sucker for the Judas kiss, the kiss of of Judas. Let us go further. One, they are chosen. Second thing that Jesus tells us, look at this carefully. One of you is a devil. There is a demonic element to their behavior. If not demonically animated, it may become demonically animated. In other words, end in some kind of demonic possession but they are, from an early point, demonically motivated. Demonically motivated, and possibly, ultimately, demonically animated. 
Initially, they are demonically motivated. Eventually, they can become demonically animated. The case of Judas himself, he was satanically animated. Satan entered him. Picture of the Antichrist once again. Notice they were secretly active. Only Jesus knew who he was. Those who give the Judas kiss, they know who they are. Satan knows who they are, and Jesus knows who they are. We do not know who they are until Christ reveals them, and until they are revealed by their own actions. Let's understand this further. Again, it points to the person of Antichrist. We deal with this in my book, Shadows of the Beast, but for our purposes today, these people are already active before it becomes obvious who and what they are. But Jesus is aware of it. Jesus always discloses it just before they give the kiss. Just before they give the kiss, Jesus discloses who they are. It should not come as a complete surprise although it comes as a surprise as to who it is. More about that in a moment. So the first point is it counterfeits the holy kiss. Secondly, the kiss of Judas is satan were demonically motivated, ultimately demonically animated. It comes from one who was chosen from our own ranks. And they are secretly active, and only Jesus knows who they are. Matthew 26, 16. Many will fall away and betray one another. They give the Judas kiss. Matthew chapter 26, verse 16. What are you willing to give to be betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 11. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. They are scheming ahead of time. They are planning an assassination. They're planning to do the hit and they plan it out very carefully. They don't do it all at once. It's something that they have been conspiring within themselves to perpetrate for some time. Let's continue looking. Why? He did it for money. Some people will do it for theocratic power. Some people will do it for another reason. But there is always a self-aggrandizing motive. There is always a self-aggrandizing, a self-serving motive why someone will betray the word of God and betray the brethren who uphold it. There is always some self-serving, self-aggrandizing motive why someone will give the kiss of Judas. Let's continue. Five. John chapter 12, verse four. Let's go through this again. The first characteristic of the kiss of Judas, it counterfeits the holy kiss. The second, the one who gives the holy kiss was chosen. They're one of us. Third, they are demonically motivated and ultimately demonically animated. Fourth, they are secretly active and seeking an opportunity. Fifth, they have some self-serving, self-aggrandizing motive. Sixth, John chapter 12, verse four. 
But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Sixth is they have a good name. They pretend to be so virtuous, so philanthropic, so generous, so caring, so concerned about the plight of the poor and downtrodden. They seem to be so Christian in their virtue. They know, again, how to wear the masquerade very well. It was Judas who inspired this kind of thinking. He didn't really care about the poor. He used to pill for the money, but he knew how to play the game. Let's continue. They have a good name. Psalm 55, verses 12 to 14, the seventh characteristic of the kiss of Judas. Psalm 55, verses 12 to 14. Now, of course, this is prophecy about Jesus dealing with Judas in the literary genre of Hebrew poetry. But we read the following in verse 12 of Psalm 55. It's not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide myself from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend, we had sweet fellowship together. We walked in the house of God in his throng. The one who will give the kiss of Judas is the one we would least expect. The one who will give the kiss of Judas is someone you would never expect to be the one to do it. Never. Again, this is a prophecy, and it is Jesus speaking through David in Hebrew poetry about what would transpire with Judas. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide myself. But it's you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. It's not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. When you get it in the back, from somebody who gives you the kiss of Judas. It's not like getting it from an enemy or even from a false brother or a carnal Christian. Look with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 12, verse 6. For even your brothers and the household of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Even they have cried aloud after you. Do not believe them although they may say nice things to you. Oh, they'll say nice things to you. They'll pretend they're still your brother or your sister, but you cannot trust them or believe them. They are treacherous, and they are from the household of your own father. This is not easy to deal with. Judas was one of the 12. The kiss of death comes from within your own ranks, your own inner circle. Someone you couldn't believe. Think of the Last Supper. The apostles had no idea. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? It's Judas. No. It can't be Judas. No, it's Judas. No one would have suspected him. The kiss of Judas will come from the lips of the person you least expect. Now, I'm not trying to scaremonger. I'm not trying to sow distrust among believers. I'm simply stating what the last days are going to be like and what we need to expect and the importance of discernment in keeping our eyes on Jesus. He will reveal them in the appropriate time. But if we have our own 
foregone conclusions. It can't be him or it can't be her. It can't be one of them. We make ourselves prey, vulnerable targets, sitting ducks. We have to understand the kiss of Judas comes from a bosom friend, someone you would not expect. I've received the kiss of Judas not long ago from a preacher and a writer who stood against error himself. Yet he took the side publicly of people who were defending error. What he admitted was heresy. They were defending and promoting heresy and he publicly took their side against me for some self-aggrandizing motive. This was a person I stood with for years endorsed and promoted his ministry, spoke in his church, but he gave me the kiss of Judas. He would have been the last person I would have expected, but you know, before it happened, the Lord began warning me. I didn't know how far it would go. I couldn't believe it when he did it, but then I put two and two together. Now I see, now I see. These are learning experiences that we must learn. It's not someone you would expect. Seven. We are told in the book of Micah, in the last days, and a prophecy of the last days in Micah, do not follow an aloof. An aloof is the modern Hebrew word for a general in an army. But it is the actual term for a lead steer, the head steer of a herd that the others would tend to follow. Be careful of following leaders. As Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. You can trust and follow Jacob Prash to the exact extent that he trusts and follows Jesus Christ not a step further. Keep me in prayer. May I always walk in his footsteps. Don't trust leaders. Trust Jesus. You can follow a leader who's following him, but make sure they are. Let's understand this. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 27, verse 5. We'll begin in verse 3. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood, but they said, what's that to us? See to it yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away, and he hung himself. Nine. 10 and 11. We will see these three characteristics where you see the kiss of Judas. Nine, the corrupt theocrats, the religious establishment, the whoever, politicians, whoever it is, who they befriended to advance their own interests, turn out not to be their friends. They just used each other. You betrayed your friend to somebody who's not your friend. That's what Judas found out. That is what someone who gives the Judas kiss will always find out. The people they go into league with against the faithful brethren or brother or sister are not their friends, and they will find out too late. 10, they will regret their action. It will go further than they anticipated, expected, or wanted. Remember, the Father always protected Jesus. In Nazareth, when they tried to push him off a cliff, he evaded them. They wanted to kill him numerable times. They wanted to arrest him at other times. But they couldn't do it. 
he was always divinely protected. As far as Judas could have known, the father was going to protect Jesus as usual. Not understanding the greater purposes of God, he thought it was going to be what always happened. So what if I betray him? He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. His father's going to protect him. I'll make a few bucks on the side. What's the big deal? That was his thinking. At least that was a major factor in his thinking. Things go further than they expect, and they regret their action. But it is too late. Their friends are not their friends. And what they've done blows up in their face and will continue to haunt them. Eleven. The one who gives the Judas kiss will always hang themselves. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. You don't have to worry about vengeance against the Judas. In a matter of speaking, God doesn't even have to worry about avenging someone who receives the kiss of death from a Judas. They reap what they sow, and they eventually, in some way or another, hang themselves. People have lost ministries, savings, family, marriage, a combination of the above. Not inconceivably their lives. A Judas will always hang himself. They'll regret what they did. The people they entered into league with are not their friends. Their friends are the ones they betrayed. Things go further than they expected. But it's too late. And in some way or another, they hang themselves. I don't necessarily mean with a noose around their neck. But it could be that. Let's continue. There is one more characteristic we will always see and need to bear in mind when we contemplate the kiss of Judas. That is the kiss of death. Matthew 24, 10. The Olivet Discourse. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many! The numbers of those who give the Judas kiss will increase astronomically in the last days. Those who give the Judas kiss will become prolific. They've always been around, but it is what we call a kalva homer situation in Madrasha hermeneutics, a light to heavy situation. Something that is always true becomes particularly true. A general truth, in this case, becomes a specific amplified truth in the last days as we get closer to the time of Jesus. It's going to happen more and more often. Remember, it's not the brother or sister who let you down in a personal issue or a personal falling out or a personal argument. It's not that. It's someone who acts against the word of God and in the process turns against you for upholding it in some way. It is a counterfeit of the holy kiss. They masquerade their actions and intent with Christian behavior, with Christian jargon, with Christian colloquialism. They carry on as if they're brothers, their sisters, everything is fine. It is a counterfeit of the holy kiss, but it's the kiss of death. 
They are secretly active. They are demonically motivated and possibly, ultimately, demonically activated. They seek opportunity. They're planning some time. They have a self-serving, self-aggrandizing motive. Be they lovers of money or of power or of something else. They appear to have a good name and to display Christian virtue. That is also part of the masquerade. The one who lifts his heel is the one you do not expect. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Again, Psalm 55, 12 to 14. Beware of leaders. Do not put blind allegiance into any leader, no matter how good he seems to be or how much truth he seems to proclaim. Keep your eye on Jesus, not the leader. You can follow the leader to the exact extent they're following Christ. It's so easy to confuse the two. Just look at the Roman papacy. Look at the Roman papacy. Let's continue. The word faith money preachers, they're teaching things totally antithetical to the message of Jesus, but people put their faith in the leaders instead of the Lord. They will regret what they did, but it will be too late. They will find out those with whom they collaborated against the body of Christ and against you are not really their friends. They betrayed their real friends. They betrayed the Lord. But after finding out too late, that there's no reversal of their actions. Then they hang themselves. And as we get closer to the return of Jesus, their numbers increase. They know how to play the game. They know how to disguise their motives with religiosity. They know evangelical speak. They know the language of believers. My bosom friend raised his heel against me. Judas knew where the Garden of Gethsemane was and where Jesus would meet with his disciples. He knew the behavior patterns of Jesus and his brethren. It's going to be people who know you, who know us, who give the Judas kiss. Now again, I'm not trying to sow fear or distrust. I'm simply saying the Judas kiss is an inescapable reality that will become more common before Christ returns and it's becoming more common already. What I'm also saying is, although we don't know who the Judas is until they strike, Jesus does. Jesus does. He always reveals them at the last moment. He knows who they are. He knows what they're thinking and planning all along. Now I say this with trepidation. You're chosen. If you are someone in the body of Christ compromising with what you know is wrong, preparing to stand against those who are upholding what is right, you have some self-serving motive for doing it, 
and you are being demonically motivated. You are on the path of Judas. It's only a matter of time before you give the Judas kiss. And it's only a matter of time before you hang yourself. Let us all take counsel and beware. The kiss of death, the Judas kiss. But there is one friend who sticks closer than a brother. There is one person who will never, ever, ever let you down. He will never let me down. Parents will turn against children, children against parents, siblings against each other. That can and does happen. But there is one we can trust more than we can trust our loved ones, our families. There's one we can trust more than we can even trust ourselves. Thank God for Jesus. He knows, he knows who's going to give the Judas kiss. And he knows long before it happens. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash. This message has not been easy, but it is necessary. God bless.